Amen. All right. We've been talking about the parables, and we're going to finish this uh, series up this morning. Now, we have a couple of people here maybe that weren't here from the beginning, and I don't want to, I can't go back and review the whole thing because then we'll just be here for way too long. But I do want to mention that Jesus started preaching, it seems like in Matthew, in the parables for a specific purpose. The specific purpose was connected to the fact that the Pharisees, and if you'll remember what Pharisees are, Pharisees were religious leaders. It's kind of like you would have politicians in America, but Israel's politicians were connected to their religion. Does that make sense? And so they were elevated above the normal folk, kind of like our politicians are, but they were also the religious because the, the nation itself was created on the quote unquote religion that God had, had given them. Uh, and so what they now through the years, they were told not just the religious because we would have to go through a whole lot of Israel's history to get to the point where the Pharisees were. But God had been telling Israel for years that he was sending them Messiah. Amen. That, that the anointed one was coming. And through the process of time, a lot of different things happened and this religious leadership rose up and they became very prideful. They became very prideful in their religion and really looked at them upon themselves as that they were so much better than everyone else. That spirit still lives today. You understand that, right? There's a lot of people that are full of a religious spirit. A lot of times people that are in leadership that think that they're better than the people that are the laity. And that's a, it's a spiritual thing that tries to tell someone that they're more elevated than, than what they really are. Well, the religious leadership, there's even places in the scripture where they began to realize and I'm paraphrasing something to the effect of is he is if he is the son of David, what's going to happen to us? <laughs> no, hold on a second. Think about that. If he really is the one that God sent, but what's going to happen to us? They literally said that. Now, that's how deceived that they are at that time. Jesus even told him one time, you search the scriptures for in them. You think you will find truth, but the scriptures speak of me and you won't have me. It's right there before your very eyes. And now I've been manifest in your presence and you don't even want to see it. You really don't want to see it. And ultimately what happened was, was that they claimed that he worked through the power of the devil. They said if he's casting out devils by the prince of devils, bells above. When that happened, it was as though the nation itself and their leadership was rejecting Jesus as Messiah. And the next thing you know, he starts preaching in these parables, right? Now, the parables are specifically their purpose is to hide because Jesus said this. He said that the purpose of the parables was to hide from the, the regular folk the true interpretation or the true meaning of what the scripture was saying purposely. Now we're not talking about the world. Like we're not talking about the people that, that you, you know, that you might know, Oh, my cousin hangs out at the rat scale. we're not talking about her. We're talking about, we're talking about the people that come and flock to the church, but aren't really the converted and serving the Lord. Because, see, the crowds were around Jesus, and he would preach in a parable, and then he'd pull his disciples. See, the word disciple means learner of Christ. He'd pull the disciples to the side and say, this is the interpretation of the meaning. This is the meaning of the parable. Now, does anybody remember what we said the word parable means? Huh? Yeah, to, to a side. The, the word means side throw, to throw alongside. And so what are we throwing alongside one another? A known meaning with an unknown meaning, right? And so we've already gone through so multiple parables, but just real quick, what we, we talked about the parable of the sower. And so what was known was the concept of how a seed responds to soil, literally, right? And then what was unknown was that Jesus was describing that the seed was the gospel, and that the soil was the people's hearts and the effect that the heart had on the reception of the soil. Uh, another thing that we learned was that in the tares and the wheat, that what was known was that tares do grow amongst wheat, that tares are poisonous, right? And that they look just like wheat till right before the harvest time. What we found out was, is that Jesus was saying, yeah, but tares grow in the midst of wheat spiritually. 
in the kingdom of God, you're not only going to have wheat, you're also going to have tares amongst them. And the disciples said, well, what we would normally do is we go pick tares out of the wheat so that we didn't get them mixed up. You want us to go do that? Jesus said, no, you don't worry about that. In the end of the age, when the harvest comes, it's going to be separated. It's going to be taken care of. So we're describing unknown things and comparing them to known things. And we're learning through these parables more distinct things having to do with the kingdom of God. And so let's see what we're going to what we're going to learn uh, learn today. We discussed previously the fact, too, about the terms regarding the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and how they're used interchangeably. So that's one of the things that I want, because I mentioned to you Wednesday night, and I'm not going to get into this too much, but I mentioned to you Wednesday night that somebody put a comment on the YouTube about the fact that I kind of was mistaken. And I mean, the person was very gracious. That's why I mentioned it to you, that I was mistaken that the world, that the field was the world. But Jesus is describing each one of these parables as saying the kingdom of God is like this. So this is related to the kingdom of God, that in the midst of the wor in the world, yes, but there's wheat and there's tares that are growing together. There, and, and in each one of these parables, as we move forward, we're going to see a mixture between good and the presence of evil together with one another. By the way, let me ask you this. Since you learned in the parable of the sower that the thorns were the cares of the world, have you been tested in any of that area of your life? It, 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 has the enemy tried to get you caught up in the cares of yeah. the world? How am I going to pay my bills tomorrow? How am I going to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow? Has he tried to come against you? Well, let me tell you something. That happens each and every time you hear the word. The enemy will come in. God allows it to happen that way. God allows the enemy to bring a trial in your life, but God's allowing it to happen to be a test mm -hmm. to remind you, you can't carry the burden of the cares of this world on your own shoulders. Right. Right. You're not supposed to. Amen. You're supposed to learn how to give it over to Amen. give the control Amen. over to the Lord. That's not an easy learning task. Therefore, for the rest of your life, you're going to. You're going to learn information from the Lord, and then you're going to be tested on the information. And sometimes you're going to fail the test, but guess what? It will come again. <laughs> it will come again, and you'll have another opportunity to learn. And sooner or later, you're just going to get tired. You're going to get tired of trying to win it on your own, right? And you're going to learn to give it over to the Lord. So kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably. But what it's describing, if you would allow me to say this, is that it's describing how the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is being played out on the earthly stage in the lives of human beings as the characters of the story. What are you talking about? Well, God's will is done in heaven already. Amen. And more specifically, from the beginning of the time after the fall, whenever God through salvation history, y'all heard me talk about that before a lot, right? How God's been in the process of creating salvation history, writing his story, called a man named Abraham out through that man, created a nation through that nation, gave us ultimately Jesus yeah. salvation history. It's yeah. it's been going on. God's been moving through the course of human history, bringing forth and fulfilling his plan. The kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is specifically related to Jesus. Now, the fulfillment, the coming of the end of the age of where Jesus came until he will come back again. And in this time frame, in the parables, we're seeing these uh, various concepts played out on the stage. And so Jesus has given us a glimpse of what it's going to look like during this time frame, from the time that he came to the time that he will come again. Jesus, one of the things he did, he came from heaven to earth, and he kind of gave us an example of how we should pray. Not kind of, he did. Look, in the, in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6 9 through 10, this is, I'm just making a point that the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God is something that is taking place on earth today. It's not in its fulfillment, but it's being played out on the stage of the earth. I want you to understand that. That, may, that shouldn't be that difficult to understand, but it's explained real clearly right here. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. We're asking that your kingdom that is in heaven would come. Amen. And he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is done in heaven. You understand that, right? God's will is, is done in heaven. But the truth of the matter is, is this. 
is that God, God desires for his will to be done on earth. There, the rebellion may still be played out in the hearts of men on the earthly stage. You understand what I'm saying? Mankind is still rebelling against God. But God squashed the rebellion in heaven. <laughs> in me, whenever the rebellion was manifest or at the time whenever God just, you know, said, okay, this is enough of this. God squashed the rebellion in heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan. He's talking about before he was in his physical human body. I saw Satan fall to the earth as lightning. Because Satan fell long before mankind was ever created. God squashed the rebellion in heaven. But the rebellion remains on earth today. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So salvation history describes God intervening with the plan of forgiveness since the fall and the kingdom of God focuses on the time frame since Jesus. This kingdom, not only did Jesus come to, to show us this prayer and to give us a glimpse of what God's will is for this earth. He also came in the, the kingdom of God came in bodily form through him. I want you to see this. We already talked about it. Matthew 12, 28. Because look, this is where Jesus started preaching in parables. This is the context of where Jesus started preaching in parables. Right here. Because they had said, you ca he cast out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. Jesus says, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come unto you. God sent his kingdom resident, his presence resident on the inside of Jesus. Oh, this is so beautiful. Jesus, Jesus said this. This isn't in my notes, but I'm just thinking about it. Jesus said that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will, create, it will bear much fruit. God the Father sent his kingdom in Jesus and allowed Jesus, like a seed, to be planted into the ground and it produced a harvest of fruit. Because as Jesus died and resurrected from the dead and the Holy Spirit descended upon the church, now whenever each individual believer receives the gospel through faith, they in turn die like their Lord to their old self, are born again, and the Holy Spirit is birthed in them. And that spirit now is spread, amen, like, like fruit on the midst of of this earth. The kingdom of God came to us in the Lord. Now we're also told in, uh, in two of the parables that this kingdom age has a specific ending. At the, in the tares and the wheat and also in the, the parable of the net we're going to see the same result that in the end the wicked are going to be separated from the righteous. Right? Furthermore, we repeatedly see the thought within these parables that both true believers and those that appear to be believers exist together. It's real important that you understand that. Sometimes I use big words that might be hard to understand. You know, I can remember, I can remember whenever one of my girls was young and they used to, they're not going to necessarily always listen to you. Are y'all cold or y'all hot? Are y'all comfortable? Okay, comfortable, comfortable. If you're good, I'm good. Your children aren't always going to necessarily listen to you. And they're not necessarily always going to agree with you. And you can try the best you can to explain things to them. Okay, but this is just one example. So we went to church and we went to a, a church that had a whole, lot of, a whole lot of people in it. And I was trying to teach my kids that, they weren't, that we didn't listen to secular music. You do whatever you want. I'm not even here. I'm not necessarily preaching on secular music. I've already explained myself on that. A million times. But so that while we're here, let me go ahead and explain it. <laughs> Why don't you like secular music, preacher? Well, the thing of it is, it's not just, yeah, it's the world. And it's coming from a different spirit. But not only is it coming from a different spirit, it has a different message. Now, just bear with me. I mean, it doesn't mean you may still listen to your music on your way home. And that's between you and the Lord. But I'm trying to make a point. It's got a different message than the message of the church. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. You are the treasure that I seek. You are the counsel that I need or whatever, however the song went. You're the, you're the treasure that I seek. But the world's got a different message. If you're looking for a treasure, it ain't the Lord. It's looking for something else. Something else that's going to fulfill the emptiness on the inside of you. Something else that you're, whether it's a relationship, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You get the point. 
It's a different message with a different spirit. Anyway, I would try to teach my kids, listen, we don't, we're not going to listen to that kind of music. Well, daddy, this one, this one, this one, and this one, dude. <clears throat> See, the, and so what I'm trying to say, it doesn't mean that those people didn't love the Lord. It doesn't even mean that if, you li that if people listen to secular music, they don't love the Lord. Sometimes people just don't have a revelation of it, right? But what I'm trying to say is this, is that there, the, the, the one, it doesn't make it right. It, it doesn't make it okay that we listen to that. And at least in this church, we're not far from perfect, but at least the preacher is willing to tell you the truth. That that's not okay. It's not. It's not okay for you to indulge yourself in a message that repeatedly tells you something opposite of what the kingdom of God is trying to communicate, right? And so, what I'm trying to get at is that's just one example. These are people that, and, and come to find out, the people that I'm talking about ain't even really serving the Lord now. So that's another story. Okay, but they're not even serving the Lord now. So what I'm saying is, is that there's a lot of times on the king, in, in the earth as the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is played out on this earthly stage that we're going to see people that look like they are Christians, but in reality that they're not. Right. right. And I'm not saying that those people aren't. That's between them and the Lord. You get the point that I'm trying to make. though, Right. All right. But so there's two kingdoms that are coexisting. Today, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Look at Colossians 1.13. It says, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You were in one kingdom in your first birth of Adam. You were born into darkness. Now you've been translated to the kingdom of the, of the son of God, which is Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Two kingdoms. Tares mixed with wheat. <laughs> evil and good coexisting on the earth. This is, I use this scripture a lot. Ephesians chapter two, verse two, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. See, there's a different course. There's the path. Jesus says, I am the way to life. There's a path that leads to life, which is Jesus. It's the path that's definitely most less traveled. Okay, uh, that's why it becomes confusing when you look at the big scene, whenever you look at the churches that are filled and you got this big scene that we flip through the channels on TV. This looks like American success. This looks like it's right, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're even preaching the truth. The flocks are moving towards that, but Jesus said there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. The, the, it says straight is the way. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way. Straight is the gate that leads unto life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. The majority of the people are going towards destruction. The fewer of people are going towards the truth. And that goes even for this big mammoth that we call the quote unquote church. The, that which calls itself church is not always truly church. Does that make sense? There's a body of Christ. He's the head. We're the body. The body does what the head says. They coexist together. And it will continue to be that way until he returns for the millennial reign. This mystery period that we're describing is characterized by a profession of faith, but also a counterfeit appearance of religion that contradicts God's true purposes and will not be separated until the final judgment. Once again, we've already said it once, but the Pharisees are a perfect example of this. Counterfeit religion reject, rejecting God's true purposes. Rejecting Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus says, I am, you search the scriptures for in them you think you find truth. Well, I am he on which the scriptures point, and yet you will not have me. And as we continue to go through these parables and we continue our own walk throughout the rest of however long we have on earth or until the Lord comes back, we're going to see this repeated thing pat patterned out where there's going to be living together, true Christianity, and false Christianity. That's why you have to learn Christianity for yourself. Yes. Amen. If you're expecting, that's why you have to do your own study for yourself. That's why it, learning the gospel is a lifelong journey. Amen. Right. You have to read, you have to study, you have to also find yourself a preacher that you feel like you can learn from, but hopefully he's telling you the truth. 
Because you have to understand the gospel. You have to be able to perceive what the gospel is really saying to be able to determine the difference between the fake and the true. There's a whole lot of people out there that are going to tell you, oh, this is fine, this is okay, when in reality, is it? Uh, there's a lot of time there's certain compromise in people's lives. You can tell people what may be right versus what may be wrong, but that doesn't always mean that they're necessarily going to agree with you. But the Lord's going to reveal particular things to your heart. And if it lines up with the word of God, that is what you follow. The Lord in his way, not what everybody else is doing. Amen. Amen. Robert and I, I mean, I'm not to get into the details of it, but Robert was just telling me something earlier this morning about how there's a whole group of people of people that he that he would not, you know, that you would know and respect. And just because a whole group of people are saying one particular thing is right doesn't mean that it's right. That's why you have to know the gospel for yourself. Amen. So that you know what's right versus what is wrong. All right. This thought of both existing together brings us to the next parable. Finally there, next parable, right here. Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 32 is the parable of the mustard seed. It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So the concept of this parable, two things thrown alongside each other, the kingdom of heaven in some way, shape or form is like a mustard seed and the results of the mustard seeds grow. It contains another example, in my opinion anyway, of how both good and evil are going to coexist in the kingdom of God. There's reference both to the mustard seed and to birds. And now listen, when it comes to the mustard seed, we should remember that. It, let's look at Matthew 17, 19 through 20. Jesus uses the mustard seed to describe the faith of believers. You remember that? It says, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence. In other words, get out of here. To a yonder place. Go from here to there and it shall be moved and nothing shall be impossible for you. The, so the mustard seed was the smallest of seeds at least known in this part of the country. And one thing I read said that, that, that I think it was an orchid seed. I think it was right. That's, I think that's right. It was maybe smaller, but they, they didn't know about that seed. Over there. So the smallest seed in that area was a mustard seed. But as an herb, it actually turned into a tree. In one season, a mustard seed, within one season of its life, would grow 12 to 15 feet high. Wow. Okay, and it's really considered an herb, but it would become a tree. And so, but it would get so big that fowls of the air or birds would be able to nest in it. And the same goes, whenever we're looking at the gospel, the same goes with the gospel and faith. Consider the smallness of the fledgling church. I mean, if you sometimes I think about these things and I'm really kind of blown away by it. the perception of what man sees as power. The church started with the disciples. Right. A, a tax collector, fisherman. Jesus dies on the cross. The church starts in the midst of the mighty Roman Empire. Everything that they tried to do to destroy it only made it stronger. I mean, when you think about Rome, and you think about how powerful Rome was, I mean, if you've done any kind of research or study on Rome, it was a very, very powerful empire. But in the midst of all of that, the church grew and became stronger and stronger. Everything that the Caesars tried to do to squash it, Nero himself... <laughs> I mean, if you, if you know anything about the history of the church, Nero would take Christians and, and cover them in pitch or tar, like an oily type tar substance, and light them on fire. Did y'all see that movie, The Apostle Paul, by any chance? Mm -hmm. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good movie. Uh, the Apostle Paul, when it came out, they literally had uh, scenes where they were walking through the streets of Jerusalem and they had Christians up hanging up and burning right there to light this the city streets. 
Rome tried to destroy the church. Nero, more than anybody, he's the one that had Paul's head cut off. But did they, were they successful? No. Nero died as the city burned and he was blamed for it. The gates of hell did not prevail. Amen. Rome has gone, has come and gone. The gospel of Jesus Christ lives on today. The supernatural growth of a mustard seed is like the supernatural growth of the kingdom of God. But also within the kingdom of God, these birds were found within the trees. You got to always remember when you're studying the Bible that if somebody just recently said something, you can't forget what they said. Jesus, in the first parable that he talked of, what did he say that the birds represented? What did he say the fowls represented? The devil and the forces of evil. That the seed that falls by the wayside, the fowls of the air come and they devour the seed of the gospel. Within the kingdom of God, we've already talked about it. You also see the presence of evil, which are the fowl that represent the coexistence of the evil along with, uh, along with the growth of the gospel taking place. That was parable number one that we're covering this morning, having to do with the mustard seed. Let's look at parable number two, the parable of the yeast. Matthew chapter 13, verses 33 through 35. Another parable spoke he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took. You know what leaven is? You know, listen, hey, does anybody in here bake? Are you a mama and you bake? Can anybody bake? Yeah, you bake. Does anybody ever bake bread? Yeah, you bake bread? Okay. Okay, Toya, you got to, you got to, you have a, 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 a you got to do, you got an illustration. You got to go home and bake bread. Sabrina, you got to go home and bake bread. Well, you don't have to, you don't have to bake it, but this is what you have to do. You don't even have to bake it. Jessica, you got to do it. Beth, you got to do it. You don't have to bake it. You got, but you got to make some dough. Come on, man. Work with me here. This is for your kids. Cause you know, like I bore them to death. So y'all just give them a revelation of what yeast does. I want you to go home and I want you to mix some flour and some water. What else you got to put in there? Egg? Are you supposed to put egg in there? No. Flour and water. Just mix some flour and water. Then I want you to take, I want you to mix it up real good. And I want you to take some, some yeast. And I want you to put some yeast in there. And I want you to mix it up in there. And then I want you to just put it in a bowl. And I want you to put a rag over and just let it sit. Is that going to work, ladies that cook bread? Okay. What's going to happen? The yeast is going to take over the dough. It's a microorganism that as it reproduces, it makes carbon dioxide and it causes the dough to rise. It takes over. That's what Jesus is talking about. Leaven is yeast. When you put a little bit of leaven in a lump of dough, it takes over and it changes the, the, the consistency, it changes the very nature of the dough. That's what the whole concept is. Now, does it change it for good or bad? Well, maybe a little bit of both. Another parable he spoke unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which, which is yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal. That's another way of saying dough. Till the whole was leavened. All these things spoke Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spoke he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Hey, you know, so before we get into the yeast, right there, Jesus reminds us again that sometimes the gospel is not that easily understood on the surface. So sometimes when you hear a message or sometimes when you read something in the Bible and you're thinking to yourself, I just don't understand what's being said. Well, guess what? So sometimes it's purposefully that way. You know, Aaron made a comment yesterday when we were eating. I don't remember exactly which, what you said, but it had to do with the fact that people want the gospel. People want God handed to them on a silver platter. Jesus never went around saying, hey. God. I'm God. He didn't say that. But he is God manifest in the flesh. He's the physical representation of the invisible God. If you're going to know the Father, you're going to have to go through him and you'll never know the Father if you don't know him. And he told Philip, he said, have you been with me so long that you didn't know that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Aaron's like, people want it handed to them on a silver platter. They want God to float down in all his glory and say, here I am. No, it's not going to be that way. It's not going to be that easy. That's right. 
You're going to have to dig like a treasure. You're going to have to dig like look like a precious jewel in order to find God. Amen. Because he's not, he's not, it's not going to just be the way that you want it to be all the time. Amen. Seek and you shall find. Because there's a lot of people that are saying that they want him, but really and truly, they're not really wanting him. They want a groovy music service. They want something that's going to make them feel good. They're wanting something that, that's going to do something for them yes. rather than asking what they can do for the Lord. I'm telling I don't know if y'all were here when John preached or not. I listened to half of his message. I'm about to listen to the other half. Man, I thought it was really good. Yes. He, he texted me a couple of times yesterday and then finally he called me up and I'm like, oh Lord, I'm going to press the button. This dude starts preaching. He's like, I'm, I'm going to quit this job. I told my wife, you better start learning how to live on a little because we about, oh man, he said, I'm tired of sitting in the walls of a church. He said, I'm about, I'm going to New Orleans. I'm going to feed the homeless. He said, I just got back today he said I went with this old boy they got people living in the woods some homeless people down the bayou I guess living in the woods I'm like how many folk you reckon they got out there he said about 30 to 50 wow. living in tents in the woods drunkards and drug addicts and he said we went over there man we fed them people played some songs and preached the gospel to them he said the guy that does it used to be one of them some lady found out that they were out there and started preaching it. And this old boy got saved. Now he done took over for her. He's like, oh man. I'm like, he said, some of them didn't smell real good. <laughs> now that's when you know the gospel's working in your life. He's like, man, I'm tired of all this church stuff, playing church. We'll get into that, to that more in, in a way, but in a moment, I think it's going to end up coming up. But listen, when we're talking about yeast, yeast also, you got to understand, has a very negative <coughs> connotation in the scripture. Uh, and, and, and we don't have to turn to these scriptures, but in Exodus 12, 15, it talked about the feast of unleavened bread. Exodus 12, 15, the feast of unleavened bread. For a whole week, they couldn't have yeast even in their house because yeast, according to the Bible, is oftentimes represents sin, evil, or false teachings. In Luke 12, 1, Jesus said, beware of the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees. What is he talking about? Their false teaching will spread like gangrene and cause destruction. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, the Apostle Paul says, he, that, that, well, go to that one for me because I'm going to mess it up. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. This is the Apostle Paul. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Get it out, that you may be a new lump, a new lump of dough without leaven, because you're unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So whenever you read this, what the Apostle Paul is talking about, this is a perfect example of why you got to read the Bible, or you got to understand the Bible. Because this is a New Testament passage that Paul is talking to, to the church of Corinth, but he's talking about the Passover feast. He's talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And if you don't know that, then you're, gonna, you're not going to have a clue what he's talking about. He's saying, hey, in the Feast of, the, of Unleavened Bread, you weren't allowed to have yeast in your house for a whole week because it represented sin. Purge that stuff out of your life because you are now a new lump. You're a new created batch of dough that doesn't have a leaven in it. Why? Because Christ, your Passover lamb, was crucified for you. He gave you new life. Yes. Gave you a new start. Amen? Amen? Let's look at Galatians 5, 7 through 9 real quick. We're talking about yeast. This is the parable of the yeast. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. False doctrine. Sin, evil, false teaching. A little, he, he, this persuasion. He's talking about this form of teaching that you've embraced. That talks about works instead of Christ. That wasn't what was given to you. And a little bit of that false teaching will, will spread and bring destruction. The nature of yeast is that when leavening starts, it permeates the whole lump. The lump is a whole batch of dough and a pinch of yeast will take over and influence the whole batch. And certainly there is the truth that the gospel has had this effect on the earth, meaning 
You put a pinch of the gospel, like we talked about, the fledgling church with the disciples in the midst of the mighty Roman Empire. You put a pinch of that, and what has it done? It has spread throughout the entirety of the earth, and it has affected the earth one way or the other. What, what do you mean? People are one thing is one of two things is going to happen. When someone is exposed to the gospel, they're either going to accept it or reject it. But I can tell you this, you will never be the same. When, if you reject the gospel, you will never be the same. You can have an intellectual person who would try to, and you told him that, listen, you reject the gospel, it is going to have a negative influence in your life. Well, let me just tell you, they, their response may be this. Oh, but, but I have good morals. <laughs> I treat people the way that I want to be treated. And that may all be true. As a matter of fact, I hate to say it, they probably got some atheists out there that probably treat people better than yeah. some of us do. Yeah. But I'm not talking about morality according to human standards. Right. You can be say yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. You can open up the door for ladies. You can carry an umbrella and help people out. You can do whatever you want to do regarding those kinds of things. But none of that makes your heart right in the presence of the Lord. Instead, what you've done is you've rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one the Father sent to pay the penalty for sin. And if you reject him, then that means that your heart now has become hardened to the way that God has Prepared. People think in their mind that because they're good, that somehow they're going to be able to get in. That's not how it works. You don't get in based on good works. Our righteousnesses, that's what the Old Testament says. Right? Our righteousnesses, meaning our works of righteousness, are like filthy rags. You don't really even want to know what that is. Some of you know what it is, but you know. It's like almost like one of them things you just don't even want to talk about in church. <laughs> All right, so so that's what it looks like in the eyes of God. Not not so much doing good works. I mean, I don't believe that that's the way God saw what John went and did whenever he went and ministered to people in the woods because his heart is right. See what I'm saying? His, what is happening is, is that out of the outflow of God's love in his life, he's wanting to let Jesus flow out of him into other people. That's the kind of works that the Lord's looking for. Not the other way around. I do works in order to please God to make me look right in his eyes. Wrong religion, Pharisees, the wrong way, counterfeit. The two of them coexisting at the same time, but one of them's a counterfeit. Does that make sense? We can't forget what we've already learned, though. Just as there are fowls along the wayside, stealing seed, tares amongst the wheat, and fowls in the branches, there is also evil trying to permeate the kingdom of God, just like yeast permeates dough. Because typically what's happening when you look at yeast in the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New, it has a negative connotation. <clears throat> <laughs> Once again, the gospel has truly spread throughout the earth and has affected everything around it. But at the same time, yeast also has an evil connotation connected to it. And these parables repeatedly are letting us know that in the midst of the kingdom of God, until the end of this age, in this mysterious period, when Jesus comes back, it's all going to be sorted out. The evil and the righteous are going to be separated. But until then, the two of them are coexisting at the same time. Parable number three, the hidden treasure. Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden in a field, the which when a man has found, he hides, and for joy thereof goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. In this fifth parable, Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to a treasure hidden in a field. Right. The man discovers the treasure and then he bought the field so that he could have the treasure. And I was seeing at least two different concepts right here. Number one, the man knew the treasure was there. This man that found this field knew the treasure was there. All right. So in some way, it's got to be talking about God, because the whole concept behind a hidden treasure is that you can't see it. But so, number one, the treasure was seen by the man who bought the field. So in some way, shape or form, God is the man who bought the field. All right. But number two, the treasure wasn't obvious to the naked eye. It was hidden because not only and this is so good because I didn't even see this this morning because like you saw that part right there, the scripture right here where it says when he found it, he hides it. So it was it was a treasure that was hidden. The man knew it was there. Right. But then once he found it, he hid it. But then he bought the field so that he could have the treasure. All right. So the, not only is the. Did the man know the treasure was there, but the treasure wasn't obvious to the naked eye. It was hidden. 
Jesus came to this world because he saw a treasure. And he was willing to purchase that treasure for a price. The treasure was you. The treasure was mankind. And the purchase price was his blood. Amen. Look at Romans chapter 6 verse 23. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A, a purchase price. Jesus gave his blood to ransom us back. Look at 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed. What does the word redeemed mean? To be bought back for a price. That's what it means in the Greek. To be bought for a price. You were not redeemed or bought with a price with corruptible things as silver and gold. You know, the way that people on earth barter and trade. But from your vain conversation or your old life that you received from the tradition of your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus had no sin in him. That's why he was the perfect sacrifice. That's why he was the perfect ransom. That's why he was able to pay the price. Look at Ephesians 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption, in whom we've been bought back through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Look at this last one here. Revelation 5 9. And they sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof for you were slain and you have bought back or redeemed us to God by, the, by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Jesus Christ saw a treasure and came to purchase the field, amen, in which that treasure was found, hallelujah, and he bought it with his blood. He ransomed it with his life. But to the naked eye of humanity, it's not so easily seen. He hideth it. Just the fact that we're preaching parables is a reminder that it's not that easily seen. And it's for a reason. Like Aaron was telling me yesterday, people want to hand it to him on a silver platter. That's not the way God is going to do it. It's easily missed because it's purposely hidden at times like through the parables. And also it looks different than what we would expect. Let's look at Matthew chapter 20 verses 26 through 27. I put this scripture in there this morning. Okay, this is just an example of how you perceive the world. Whether you like it or not, we all are affected by it. It shall not be so among you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He said, the Gentiles lord over. Meaning, the Gentiles that have authority treat the people that are under them harshly. You ever had a boss that was a bonehead? I've had some bosses that were boneheads, man. And I mean, oppression. You talk about hate to work for them kind of people. I could go off on story. But, and he would laugh, but I don't have time. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. The word in the Greek is diakonos. It's where we get the word deacon. It means, it means servant. Whoever's going to be greatest, let him be the servant. All right, next verse. And whosoever shall be chief. In other words, the word is protos, first. First and more prominent. Whoever's going to be prominent among you, let him be your Slave actually is what the word would be. Do this. Let him be the slave. The kingdom of God is, is flip-flop upside down. What you perceive to be power, that's why it's so hard to see. What you perceive to be power is the opposite of what God says. Why? Because mankind is full of pride. Mankind was injected with poison from Satan who was full of pride and said, I will exalt myself above the throne of God. I will, uh, I, and he was going to elevate himself. And that's what God caused that rebellion to be squashed. And mankind born of Adam is born with the sin of pride on the inside of him. He wants to be elevated and he wants to everybody to know how good he is. There's a part to each and every one of us that's that way. And uh, sometimes in different ways. Listen, the major once again, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. The majority of where people are going, I don't even know why I put this here, but I was thinking so many people are heading in a certain direction and it's whatever the popular fad is today. Yeah. Yeah. But ain't nobody going out. I mean, I'm not saying nobody is, but the majority is not going after the gospel. 
Pick and choose any new fad and people will flock to it. I just remembered this thing. I don't even remember what it was called. Pokemon. That's what it was. I couldn't remember, so I just put Pikachu right here. Because I couldn't remember what it was called. But, because I just remembered the Pikachu, I can even recognize that crazy little thing. Because these kids came into the clinic. I'm talking about when it, when it went digital. You know remember what I'm talking about? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all remember that? It didn't last very long. But all of a sudden, Pokemon went digital. Pokemon Go, is that what it's called? Go, yeah. I'm driving down the road on Front Street and all of a sudden I see all these kids, man. I'm kind of different people, like teenagers, young adults. Some people preppy looking, some people grunge looking. People wearing different kind of clothes. All of them together, like this little community. Come to find out it was Pokemon Go community. <laughs> we got a fat of Pikachu on the seawall over here in Morgan City. Everybody flocks to the seawall. I'm talking about there was 50 people out there. I'm like, what the heck is this? <laughs> Drove by, saw somebody I knew. I'm not going to tell you who it was. But I'm like, what is this? People getting caught up yeah. in what everybody else is doing. They did the most silly, ridiculous thing. Yeah. Because people want to be part of something. Oh, but nobody wants to be part of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Nobody, Because it doesn't look like what everybody else says is cool. That's why you got to be careful of a church where everybody thinks it's so cool to be a Christian. But that's another story for another time. It's not easily seen. Jesus purchased the treasure for a ransom price. The ransom price was his blood, but it's not easily seen. We go back to the story of the manger. It doesn't make sense. The king of kings and lord of lords born in a manger amongst stinky animals. I know I say this all the time, but I'm going to keep saying it every Christmas. I'm yeah. going to say it. It makes no sense to the logical mind. The kings are born in palaces. Yeah. Yeah. The donkey. That was next on my list. Troy said it before me. The donkey. Kings ride stallions. Not this one. He rode in a town on a donkey. The foolishness of preaching. <coughs> Man, especially nowadays. Man, we got videotape. We got, we, you know, and that's fine. Video can preach too. I, I'm not trying to be, you know, you get the point that I'm trying to make though. But I mean, the, he used the foolishness of preaching. Don't let the modern church lie to you and tell you that that's why, oh, that's why we got these shiny lights. That's why we got these strobe lights. That's why we got whatever we got. Because, man, God's doing a new thing. That's what they're saying. Yeah, God is doing a new thing. It's called Jesus. And it's called preach the gospel. People respond by faith. The Holy Spirit comes on the inside of their heart and changes them and makes them a new creation in Christ. That's the new thing that God is doing. Amen. And he's not going to change it. Amen. Until he does the next new thing, which is the rapture of the church. And then the next new thing after that, whenever Jesus comes back and ends this age that we're talking about. So that was the parable of the hidden treasure. Amen. Now the parable, the fourth parable, the pearl of great price. <clears throat> uh, Matthew 13, 45 through 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man. Seeking goodly pearls. That word goodly in the Greek means precious or beautiful. Who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, I believe we're seeing a combination in some way, shape, or form of what God did and also how he sees man. He gave all he had for us. What, what, you just stop and think in your own mind. You don't have to shout it out. But what is the most precious thing on earth in your mind? I, I know you're going to say Jesus because we're, we're being holy right now. I mean, I don't mean that to be rude. You know, we're talking about, we're think, we're, we have our mind on the Lord right now. So we're going to say that that's the church thing to say. But let's just say, besides the Lord and the things of God, if you closed your eyes and you thought about it, what would be the most precious thing on earth to you? You chill. Not a lot of people would say that. Right? And so whatever it is in your mind that you're thinking of, what is more precious to a father than his son? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I mean, how pre it may be hard for you and I to wrap our mind around that, but can you imagine offering up your son, your child as a sacrifice for people that are going to spit in your face, for people that are going to shake their fist in your face? I remember Brad used to say it, but, but it's true. My old preacher, he used to say, I ain't giving my son for you. 
I used to say, man, you, you, need, you need the Lord to, to minister to your heart. But I mean, it's true. I mean, especially after he had been a preacher for a while. He's like, I definitely ain't giving up my son for you. <laughs> yeah, really? After the way you had treated me last week, Miss So-and-so? The dude told me, the dude told me, man, that lady told me back she didn't like my haircut. I was like, are you even serious, bro? She's worried about your haircut after the message you preached? That was a good message you preached. She worried about your haircut. <laughs> All right, anyway, that's another story. The more Jesus, the Father, gave his son. He gave all he had for us, and our response to him is that we give what we have to him. Your flesh not, may not like it, but that's the deal. That, you know, that's one of the things, that, well, another thing that John said yesterday. And I remember when the Lord first gave me this revelation. It's like, God gave me everything. Now he's asking me to give something back. I'm right. tired of sitting in the walls of the church. I want to go do something for the Lord. Matthew 16, 24 through 25. This is, this is what I'm talking about here. He sold all he had for this pearl. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. That is a whole lot to be said about that. You know what I think about? I think about people with friends. I think about young people a lot. This is a little message where I intervene and I try to talk to young people for three seconds. But not just young people, older people too. Because you know why? A lot of times we're influenced by the popular thing. There's a part in our lives where we kind of want to be liked by people. I don't know about you, but I mean, you know, nobody likes not being liked by people. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. Well, and that's what ends up happening. You start to realize that it's not really that important. But the truth is, is that there's a time frame in a young person's life whenever it is important. You don't want to be the one that they're roasting. That's the new thing now. We've been talking about, really, we know what roasting sessions are because it's been around forever, but now the kids have taken the word and ran with it. But you don't want to be the topic of the roasting. I've been, I, I always used to hang out around with people that were bigger and tougher than me. I don't know why I just did, but I had the biggest mouth. And I would run my mouth. And you want to talk about a real roasting, I would say this. Because I think the boys would get a kick out of it. Brianna probably would. I can remember one time I was talking so much trash to my friends. We were at, a, we were at this rodeo thing in, in, in Lafayette, and we were over there by where the, the stock, you know, the, uh, they kept the livestock. They're all up in the hay, and I was just talking trash, like, oh, y'all ain't blah, blah, blah. Dude, them boys grabbed me, and they took all my clothes off except my underwear, and they threw it in all kinds of directions, and I was running around. like, yeah, you want to run you? You talk about a roasting. They didn't have to say nothing, dude. They just, they just did it, right? You don't want to be that person that's getting roasted. It's not fun. You want to, you want to be liked by people. That was my own fault. I deserved every bit I got. The next time you give me a hard time, Maddox, that's what you got coming, bro. Not me. Lucas has roasted me on the slick. All right. So, so... Deny himself. That was where I was going with this scripture. It talks about the fact that people are trying to save their life. I don't want to look dumb in the eyes of other people. I don't want to talk about Jesus in public because when I do, people are going to think less of me. I don't want to connect myself to the gospel because I won't be the most popular person. That's just one form of trying to save yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Instead, But Jesus said if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. He says that if you're going to follow after me, you must take up the cross. I used to say this all the time. The cross is an instrument of death. It brings death to who you used to be. And it brings resurrection life to who God wants you to be. Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I remember one time I was worshiping the Lord. This was such revelation for me. This scripture right here, but God worded it to me in a different way. I was at the old church worshiping the Lord, and all of a sudden there was a, a new youth pastor was coming or something. I don't remember what the deal was. And the youth was playing music. 
And I was up at the front worshiping the Lord, and all of a sudden, God spoke to my heart. He said this, I gave my life, this scripture right here, but worded in a different way. I gave my life so that you could live, and I need you to give your life to me so that I can live through you. He who tries to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life, he will, it will be saved. Amen. We're talking about giving up self for something more precious. Sold all he had so he could get that one pearl. Maybe not in today's society, but in ancient times when a bride married her groom, her identity was swallowed up in his. She took his name and his identity. The bride was precious and worth a great price. She was of great value to her father. The groom would literally pay a purchase price to her father, and she became his. The pearl is precious. Jesus was the most precious thing that God had, but that should show you how precious you are to God. That's right. Because he gave the most precious thing that he had in order <coughs> to purchase you. One last thing about a pearl that we should consider is how they are uniquely formed. You ever, you ever heard about how a pearl is made? It's because on the, under, on the underside or the tender side of an oyster, there's an irritation. And that irritation causes the oyster to begin to secrete some type of a something. And with time, that irritation ultimately ends up forming and turning into a pearl. What a beautiful picture that is painted by the pearl. The irritation or the tender side of the Lord, the death of his humanity, produce, produce payment for something that was precious to God. In addition to trials in the life of the believer. Because this irritation also produces the irritation in your life. The things that you come into contact with, the frustrations, the trials, the tribulations, produce something beautiful also in your life. Right? The Word of God, you don't have to go to all these scriptures, but in 8, Romans 8.29, it talks about the fact that you and I are conformed into the image of Christ. That means we're being molded into the image of His dear Son. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12-13, through 13, he says you shouldn't consider it strange as far as the fiery trial as though it were something strange that happened to you, but you should rejoice because you're becoming partakers of the sufferings of Christ. This earth is against the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you feel an attack from the enemy, when you feel an attack that the enemy uses other people to come against you, when you find trials in the workplace, when you find trials in, in your family life, when you find trials with other people around you, one of the things that you need to understand is this. The enemy wants to use it to destroy you. Can I say that again? The enemy wants to use trials in your life to irritate and to destroy you. God, though, has allowed it to happen. There is nothing that can happen in the life of the believer that God doesn't allow to happen. That's right. God is allowing it to happen so that a pearl will be formed. Amen. Whatever that area of your life is, listen, there's certain areas of your life that God wants to get rid of. God wants to apply the cross to certain areas of your life. What are you talking about? He wants it dead. He wants it gone. And he wants to replace it with resurrection life. And the one that he, that he brings death to today, there's going to be a new thing that he wants to bring death to tomorrow. And through the process of trials and grace, it's an ongoing thing that's taking place where pearls are being created in your life as a believer. That's what Peter said. He said, 1 Peter 1, 7 through 9, I'm just going to read it fast. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. Your faith is more precious than gold. God allows the trial of fire to be placed on it so that the impurities that are like on gold can be removed. Hebrews 12, 11, I like this one. I, and I didn't give you the long version. Normally I give you the long version. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. <clears throat> Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. What is chastening? Chastening is discipline and instruction. What is grievous? Pain. God allows, God sometimes allows pain in the life of believers to bring about a better result as we continue to learn how to trust in Him. Listen, 
you're going to find out sooner or later that nothing that this world has to offer is really going to fulfill you. And you're going to be left with one choice. Who will you, where will you turn? <clears throat> when your friends let you down, when your spouse let you down, when your job let you down, when your best friend let you down, when your preacher let you down, where will you turn? The only thing that's left is the Lord. Amen. And that's what he's trying to get us all to. That's where he's trying to bring us all to. That we would hope and trust ultimately in him. <laughs> Last one, the parable of the net. We're closing with this. Again, the kingdom. Uh, this is Matthew 13, 47 through 51. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says unto them, have you understood all these things? They say unto him, yea, Lord. In the last of these parables, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a net that's full of great catch of fish. Fishermen pulled the net to the shore. The fish were sorted out. The good ones kept, the bad ones thrown away. Like the tares and the wheat, this sorting represents the end of the age whenever the righteous and the wicked will be separated.